this computer. There we go. Okay, awesome. Well, we'll get, we can get started. Uh, just uh, for those of you who may not have met, I'm Peter Gilbert. I'm on the Community Engagement Committee and I also volunteered to help uh, to lead the business subcommittee. And along with Becky, who's the executive director of uh, Link. And uh, tonight we have with us Dylan, uh, is it Freed? Freed, yeah. Uh, Yep, and uh, John Lindstrom, and they're going to talk to us about uh, parking meters. And again, this is just purely informational, just so we can understand what's out there. Nothing can really happen uh, on this. It's it's not not it's not inevitable. It's just uh, we we want to make sure everybody knows what's going on and and what's available to us. And it would take uh, some movement by Linnea for that to even uh, get started. So, um, with that said, if Becky, you want to add anything? Nope, that's great. Okay, well, Dylan and John, if y'all want to just take it over. Sure, well, thanks for having us. Um, I'm Dylan Freed I'm with uh, Public Work, Minneapolis Public Works, Traffic and Parking Services. Uh, I manage the on-street parking systems, so uh, the parking meters and uh, critical parking are, are resident permit programs, and I'll let John introduce himself as well. And I'm uh, John Lundstrom. I work directly under Dylan as an operations analyst. I handle a lot of the technical and planning aspects of the program. And I have a few slides I put together on a PowerPoint. Do you think I'm going to be able to share my screen for that? So I did share co-host capabilities with you. Did you see that, Dylan? All right, I think so. There we go. Yep. You got it? OK. We good. see it. Yeah, perfect. All right. Let me go full screen here. Um, so yeah, we, we understand that you know there's some parking challenges in the Linden Hills business node. And so um, thanks for the opportunity to just talk about you know some of the tools that that we use to, to manage uh, parking uh, around the city. Uh, so you know our parking meter system is uh, primarily, you know, of course, centered on downtown. We, we have a total of 9,200 meter spaces throughout the city. About a third of those are in the, the true core, the central business district. Uh, but about two thirds of them are in outlying neighborhoods um, in other business corridors in the city, especially around hospitals, colleges, and universities. John? We uh, utilize a pay by space format, uh, which means we pay for one space at a time through a space number. Um, for wherever your vehicle is very specifically parked. You've probably all noted what we call delineators out on the street to let you know what space you're in, what restrictions may apply, and what hours you need to pay for. Uh, as of right now, we use two uh, payment options. The pay stations, which are pictured here on screen, allow you to directly pay for the space and give you relevant information. Um, they account for 30% of our transactions on average. And we also utilize a mobile payment application through Park Mobile which accounts for 70% of our parking transaction volume. So we have some, some citywide guidance um, around our, our, our metered parking and on-street parking generally that was provided by the Transportation Action Plan that was kind of a subsequent document, document to the city's comprehensive uh, 2040 plan. Uh, the Transportation Action Plan covers a lot of things transportation related, um, really focused on transit and other initiatives, but uh, specific to on-street parking, and it encourages um, us to work towards, you know, supporting transit corridors by actually managing parking, by uh, having different pricing of parking, dynamic pricing, um, and expanding metered parking. Um, you know, the Action 5.9 price on-street parking to support our, our city's mode share goals, um, and then also evaluate whether meters and price curb space should be uh, expanded to new corridors. So there is a lot of um, city policy this, you know, having this just passed a little over a year ago, we're still working through a lot of the um, specific action items that were, were called out in the transportation action plan. And so we, we tend to see three primary parking frustrations that people bring to us. The number one by far is the inability to find a spot to park, especially a convenient spot near to where a customer, um, resident or guest wants to go. 
Uh, second, uh, people tend to deal with arbitrary or confusing regulations, uh, such as you can only park for 15 minutes or one hour at a time. Um, the parking restrictions might make it difficult to ascertain when is appropriate to park. Um, items like that. And then the third is the cost of parking, such as uh, the, the price being too high by some metrics or opinions, um, or just there being priced parking at all. Yeah, and we put these in a specific order because we, we these, uh, you know, you can't always um, have everything that you want, right? And so if you want uh, free parking, sometimes it can be difficult to find a spot, but if you want more convenient and accessible parking, it might need to be priced. Um, and so, so it's kind of a, a game of, you know, what do you truly want to support? And we, we find that the, the number one frustration amongst everyone, even more than actually paying for parking tends to be, I can't find a spot. And so that's where metered parking comes in. Um, we, you know, as far as parking management tools that the city has, you know, it, 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 it's kind of a short list of things that we can do really. And so metered parking, we've kind of described some of that uh, up in the Linden Hills area right now, there's the two hour parking signs. And so we certainly have some of these areas of the city that do have just the, the limited time parking. And then kind of comparing the two of them, um, one of the primary advantages of metered parking is the operational efficiency of it. You know, when an enforcement agent shows up, you know, they can immediately check to see if if the car that they're monitoring is compliant or not. Um, compare that to the, you know, a space that just has two hour parking signs that agent needs to chalk the tire and actually record the, the vehicle um, license plate and location. Um, document where that is and then they need to leave and then come back two hours later and so. You know, and numerous people could have arrived in new spaces since then too. And so just the sheer operational efficiency makes the, the limited time parking much more challenging and much more resource intensive. And it's just much less effective as an actual management tool. Um, it relies almost entirely on willing compliance of people, whereas metered parking, it, it's substantially more op operationally efficient. Um, of the resources and we gain much better compliance of people actually turning over the space. Um, the other primary advantage of metered parking is that you can vary the pricing in order to manage demand. And so we have rates ranging anywhere from 50 cents an hour to $5 an hour throughout the city um, when there's events going on. So um, we can employ um, varying that rate to also manage the demand. You know, we recognize that any price is too high for, for some motorists. However, you know, like we, to reference our last slide, we find that more than having to pay, most people are just frustrated when they cannot find a space um, as their primary grievance with parkings. And of course, like the limited time parking, you know, it ends up being like the tragedy of the commons and encourages everyone to drive, which is not really in line with the city's mode share goals and climate goals. And it, it results in a lot of people circulating, looking for space then uh, too, when they just outright decide that driving is the only way they're gonna get around, which um, increases vehicle circulation and traffic in the area as well. So when there's available parking, when i.e. You know, some vacancy on the curb with, with metered park, that circulation in vehicles. Yeah, so this leads to uh, managing parking demand to be mostly full but not completely full is the top goal of metered parking. You can aim for around 70% uh, of spaces being occupied with 30% able to slot in a vehicle that, that wants to find a place to park, uh, hopefully as close to where their destination is as possible. The uh, two maps you see here represent uh, the Uptown and Lynn Lake areas, as well as the Marcy Holmes neighborhood. Um, Uptown, you see here on the left, and Lynn Lake especially, uh, the darker reds represent a much higher rate of occupancy. Um, so uh, the deep reds meaning almost fully occupied at almost all times they're able to be enforced. As a result of this demand, especially in Lynn Lake there on the right of the uh, Uptown map, and we're going to be expanding metered parking to the cross streets to uh, help enable additional parking spaces for people to utilize and hopefully ease some of that demand on those core avenues. Uh, 
On the right in Marcy Holmes, we actually saw kind of a lack of utilization in certain areas. And our analysis found that to be uh, as a result of two restrictive hour limits. Um, two hour limits were utilized across the neighborhood almost unilaterally when many of the trips were actually trying to target durations longer than two hours from what we could ascertain. Um, you could attend multiple events, dinner, uh, shopping items and in trips longer than two so we're actually just now implementing an expansion to four hour limits, as well as reducing some rates and uh, increasing some hour limits even more so. So the adjustments can kind of go both ways. With it being metered parking, we can actually analyze their utilization and then make adjustments from there to help reach this mostly full, but not completely full goal. Yep, and I'll add on to that. You know, what, what we're looking at here is actually what we just put together earlier this week. Um, we do monthly analysis of, of all areas of the city to build these types of maps to continually monitor demand. So this is the total amount of paid time in each of these areas for, for April. We try to, to touch every part of the city every year to, to monitor for these adjustments where we'll you know, relax time limits and lower rates in areas where we see that the demand is not uh, what we're expecting, but we also look to, to increase rates and potentially reduce time limits if we have areas where we, we do need additional turnover. So it's an ongoing and rolling process of constru constantly uh, monitoring the demand that we have and making adjustments to the tools we have. So that's all we put together just as a, as a short one over of what our parking meter system is and how it, it operates. So certainly if you guys have any questions, we'd love to answer. We enjoy talking about parking, so. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? You can feel free to just jump in. I do. Um, what, do you guys have um, an example neighborhood of where you didn't have metered parking that you recently installed metered parking in the last year or two and how that evolved in their respective situation and how that's gone down in the more recent future or past, I should say? Sure, we're, we're, we're in the process right now. I don't know if you're familiar with Malcolm Yards uh, over by in the Surly Brewery. It's over on the east oh. end of uh, east end of town, um, straight on the border with, uh, with St. Paul. Um, it's like the neighborhood is, has become much more dense. It used to be a lot of industrial uses and, and parking lots that have been developed heavily. And with the Surly Brewery and the Malcolm Yards Market, it's a, a food court. Um, the parking demand has exploded over there. And so we're, we're currently in the process. We did a lot of outreach with the, the neighborhood organization and talked directly with a lot of those businesses and you know, explained what we were doing. There, there are meters, it, it's, it's near the U of M, so there's meters you know, a few blocks away from there, but we're currently expanding into that area right now. Um, when we do expansions like that, we tend to come in with like relaxed time limits and our lowest rates. You know, we don't want to come on too strong. We want to kind of come in um, and, and make the transition from free to paid parking as, uh, as palatable as possible for people. And then what we're going to continue to monitor how, the, how it goes. And then um, if we need to adjust rates up again, uh, we, we may need to do that. But uh, we're in the process right now uh, of getting the, those installations in. So that's one example that we've been working on. And there's been several um, kind of adding on to existing metered areas that we've done. Um, again, in South Minneapolis, like along that Lynn Lake corridor and um, adjacent to um, Uptown and Hennepin Lake. So, so, you know, we think we're, our meter system has grown by about 10%, 15% over the last three years, I think. So, we have a number of these pocket neighborhoods where, where there used to be the limited time signs, just like there is out at Linden Hills, where we're transitioning a lot of them to metered parking instead. So. What kind of feedback have you had from the business owners in some of those areas where you've either not had meters or call it open parking and things like this? But, um, it seems restrictive to me as, as a consumer, if I'm 
coming in and, and buying a you know five ten dollar item or something like this and i gotta be inconvenienced with that but uh, again to your case maybe they actually have a spot them or some what kind of response yeah. have you gotten from some of those business owners yeah i mean it, it, it's almost a universal truth with a lot of these that that transitioning to metered parking is met with a lot of skepticism and and we know that you know we, we go into it we try to explain and, and try to demystify this for everyone um, and it, it's almost universally the case too that after it's in place things settle down and um, and people are, are fine with it again uh, people a lot of people's number one complaint is that I just don't have a space to park and so when, once we introduce this management of the space space um you know the, a lot of the customer feedback is, ends up being positive to some extent that it's a little bit easier to find spaces after that but and what is the acclimation period that you had experience with are we talking month or six months or two years or not definitely not two years people def tend to adjust to it within you know a couple of weeks to a couple of months um is when things tend to to die down um it's helpful to to interject that we don't tend to jump to any kind of what someone may call an extremely expensive price point for parking and new installations. They tend to spread organically over a geographic area uh, based on localized demand, but that usually means new installations, not all the time, but usually are in the lower end of the pricing spectrum. So if you're going for that $10 item, you may be paying the 50 cents per hour parking rate, not two or $3 that we have at the core. And so do you, I mean, to, to me, this is, a, this is I, 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 when I think about this, what I think is that the people who are coming to, uh, to this area is people like to drive in, park for five minutes and leave. I, I feel like that's a, that's a common, many of the, Maybe, maybe you would be going to two different stores or maybe you'd be going to one of the restaurants. But a lot of the times you just, you, you, you've got a few places that you go and you go there for this one thing and you just want to be able to park and grab it and drive on. And so does, is it your, is it your sense that parking meters affect how do meters affect that um, that kind of you know that that level of what the word would be transiency almost mm -hmm. and and what I think that I don't know how much the the businesses will will suffer from this but I, it it strikes me as a thing that the the community at large is more likely to bristle at the hassle factor than the fifty cents for their hour factor. You know, just I not only now I not only have to drive in and find a spot and run in, I gotta remember to plug it into my phone or go to the thing and punch it in and put my credit. I mean, that to me is I my sense is that is that the pushback that we would get would not only come from the the business owners and how this is affecting them, but from the kind of the community at large. And so you, can you speak to that? Yeah, so I'll speak quickly to, to two parts of that, that comment. First, oh, I, I've been to, to this area of the city um, and, and visited businesses over there, certainly. Um, and and it, it has a, quote, parking problem, right? Not because every single parking spot is full of people that are stopping in for five minutes to grab something. And so one of the, the primary things that, that metered parking would help with is to to the people that are, are staying there for excessive amounts of time, which is probably employees of the, some of the businesses that are just parking there. Right. So, the people who are breaking the rules that their bosses told them not to break. <laughs> yeah. So, so metered parking would really help with managing a lot of that demand. Maybe they go park in a mid neighborhood. Maybe they take an Uber, ride a bike, ride the bus, you name it. So meter parking would really help stem that, that long-term and parking and breaking of the rules. So we try to, to manage our curb space. So it's like we said, mostly full, but not completely full. 
So kind of one of the primary goals is that there would always be a space available. And so I agree, it's a hassle. You know, you have to do something other than just park and walk in. Um, so you do either have to walk down to that pay station, but I would highlight that we've grown from 0% in 2015 to, to a little over 70% of mobile app transactions. The routine users of our space are the highest adopters of mobile apps. And so right. people just whip out their phone and they can make a, a you know, book a spot to be there for 30 minutes, you know, paying a quarter, 50 cents, whatever it is, and walk in and do their transaction. So we feel that the, the mobile payment option has really reduced that inconvenience factor. But yeah, you're right. I mean, it, it totally is adds another step to what you got to do. But it's a difference between finding a spot and not finding a spot, you know. That's that can of, be the tipping point. Sorry. So if you, it, it sounds like you know our neighborhood a little bit. If you were to, if you were to advise, if, if we were thinking that we might want to adopt this, where would you think these meters would go? I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a couple of main streets. Are you just, would we mostly just be talking about like, you know, a hundred yards in every direction from the traffic light or something like that? Sure, yeah, I'm, I'm a Twin Cities Sailing Club member, so I'm there often in the summer. <laughs> so um, so I, I'm a, I visit the neighborhood. I've also gone out there to, you know, we were asked to, to look at this um, just pre-COVID as well. Um, and so I had scouted it out a little bit there. And, and I think the, the most likely place that we would start would be um, to replace the existing two hour signs and just where those are currently posted, transition those areas to be meters. And so that is basically Upton from where it splits with Sheridan up to uh, 44th, and then 43rd from where the bend is on in the neighborhood up to, um, what is it? it? Starts with the V, I forget the name of the street there, but. Vincent, yeah, that's, uh, that makes sense to me. I mean, that makes, that makes total sense to me. But we, we have a joke in our office that, you know, if we put meters in the wrong spot, they're expensive, no parking signs. And so, um, you know, we wouldn't we want to make sure that that this is the right thing to do before we would put them out. You know, it, we want to manage demand as, uh, you know, it's part of the city goals to, to price parking, right? To help with, again, the climate emergency mode share goals. But frankly, more than anything else, we would want metered parking to help contribute to the economic vibrancy of the neighborhood. You know, sometimes in a, when they're put in the right spot, businesses can actually see more, more customers, right? Because there's, right. Uh, they get more turnover and so people limit their stays more. And so you can actually see more people through the door um, if you get the right formulation. Right. I have a and question. Is there a lot of, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, can meter is meter parking only allowed on city streets or can it be sometimes used with private property like during certain times of the day or the weekend? Yeah, so we're, we're in public works, we're in the business of regulating the public right of way. And so anything that was in the public right of way, we, we could, I mean, certainly if, if there's private properties, they can look at um, other paid parking programs of their own, but um, it would just be public right of way that, that we're we're talking about specifically here. So, so yeah, city streets. Stump the stars. Are there, yeah, are there any, yeah. One question, any more questions? Yeah, if you think of anything else, feel free to let us know. We'd love to come back and talk with you more if you have more questions or if you, Becky wants to get them to anything to us in an email, um, certainly let us know. We're going to share the recording also with the whole group um, so that we, we kind of have a mailing list of the business and property owners at large. So I, I will offer that up to them as well to say, please, you know, watch this. And if you have questions, is it okay to share your email with them so they can reach out to you directly? Absolutely, please do. Great. Yep. Okay. Yeah, thank you guys Dylan so much. John, yeah, thank, thank you so much for thank coming you. tonight. Yeah, really, really helpful. the information. Very informative. Great. I mean, Absolutely. I think John might be able to stay for a bit though. But thanks everyone. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, thank you sir. And I see that Don is here. So Don, uh, 
is here to talk about the Charlie Path to give us the history, the current status, and also to answer questions. So uh, welcome, Don. Uh, how's my connection? Can you hear me okay? Good. Yes, sir. Hi, Don. Can you see me? Nice to see you. Yes. yes sir. <laughs> <laughs> nice to finally meet you. Uh, that's going to be a tough PowerPoint to follow. I don't have I don't have a fancy PowerPoint display. Um, first off, so my name is Don Elwood. I'm the I, my job title is Director of Transportation Engineering and Design. It's a long long job title. Um, and it's just easier to say I'm the engineering director, and I'm I'm responsible for the roads and bridges in Minneapolis, and then. Um, right of way and a lot of the special assessments and other weird other duties as assigned, but primarily roads and bridges and trails in the city. And so I got asked to uh, <clears throat> come to your group tonight, and talk to you about the trolley line. And so I'm gonna try to share my screen and we'll see how that works. Oh, I get, I'm disabled to, I can't do it. All right, I have to unmute. I. I need to do that, okay. and I'm my my view right now. I have now, to make you. And I'm used to using right. Teams, so on Teams I can I know how to like figure out sorry. which windows to go. So I don't know. Right. What's you should be all set now, Don. I'm sorry. Kind of fun. <laughs> when you said you didn't have a fancy PowerPoint, I thought, oh, maybe he doesn't need to share. So, did you get the co-hosting invitation? Um, let's find out. So yeah. okay, let me do. Which one do I, oh, I got a screen too, because I got multiple screens here. Yes. See, so did that. All right, I see it. Okay, do you see like a really old map? Yes. And then I'll make that full, full screen. Oh. Sorry about that. I'm in a, I'm in a uh, different area than you are, so I got a tornado warning going on. Oh boy. Okay. So um, I pulled this map up. So this is from 1908. So I'm not going to give you all the history from 1908, but it's a good starting point. And the, the map is rotated. North is the left. So if I rotated clockwise, then it would be north would be up, but it just fits better this way. And uh, the trolley line runs, and I don't know if you can see that. I don't know if I can see that where I'm Yeah, tracing. I can see it. Yep, sure. Yep. And then this this is that the trolley line that's still there today. And it, yep. you know, right there by the lake and the water fountain. And, and then it goes up along the cemetery and then just kind of stops. But the, the right of way never really stopped. It actually goes, it continues on up to about 32nd, jogs over and goes up to Lake Street and so that's the history of this, this trolley line. And then it, it, it went out west quite a ways. So um, hopefully that changed for you. Now you see a slightly different, different map with some colors on it. I'll try to make that a little bigger. So let's fast forward a little bit. And so it, in, from 1908, um, then there's some other critical years that happened. 1954, 5 4, 1954, 1960, 1993, and 2014. <clears throat> and this is a this is this is kind of like a living property map document that that we use in our office, and we work with the county, and and we start to record what are called deeds or vacations or uh, right away transactions. And I get to slide number three, and uh, this really zooms into the what I think is the area in question, or the area I get questioned the most about. Right. Uh, it's a snapshot of snapshot of what's what's going on, kind of right now. So uh, <clears throat> this whole in in the fifties, this entire trolley line was acquired by the city of Minneapolis. They bought it. They bought it from the Minneapolis and St. Paul Suburban Railroad. They bought everything. And so 
west of where that gate is, all the way out to the road, that's city owned land. And we bought it in 1954. Yep. Over the course of the years, so in the 60s, this on the, uh, what I would say, east of um, Upton, uh, there was some land that was vacated to adjacent property owners. And then again, in 1993, these shaded parcels were vacated to the adjacent property owners. And sorry for jumping around, but this is, this is a, more of a present day map that shows who owns what. And these are the legal, legal names of who owns what, but these, these vacated areas in, these, in this alley went to the abutting property owners. So it went to the Church of St. Thomas, it went to uh, the bread store, it went to this, this line right here. Yep. And what's left out there today is a 16 feet wide alley. Yep. And you can see the turnaround I built. So the, the, the right of way that's out there really ends at the, at the end of Settergren's Ace Hardware, where that property line is. And beyond that, that's all city right of way. And then I, I built this cul-de-sac back here, this turnaround. So that's a little setup of, of what's, going out, what's going on out there from a property perspective today and kind of how we got there going back to 1908. And the city bought the land and then um, much of this land was vacated to the adjacent property owners. Property owners. Then I jotted down a, something of how, how did I get here? <laughs> so in 2014 and 2015, right around 2014, I was asked to take a closer look at this alley. And I looked at different options. Maybe before I get, maybe before I go on, any questions so far? Everything's clear so far to me. Okay. So in 2014, 2015, and you know, it doesn't sound like too long ago, but that was eight years ago. So uh, 2014, I, I started looking at this and um, I looked at different options. Um, one of the, you know, the, the ask was, um, you know, the alley looked like it was wider than it was but it, it really is just a 16 foot wide alley. So that was the problem. I looked at possibilities of making an L shaped alley. Like, could I get the alley to come down here and either come out through this property or come out through this property? Um, I looked at um, you know, those two options. And at the time, what I would say is the vision was not clear what, the residents and the businesses want it. Um, there was also no money to do much. And um, so that progressed to um, many of the people said, well, we can't turn around. So back in 2017, I, I built this cul-de-sac so people could turn around. And I put a new, new gate back here. And then I went on to other projects and that gets me to where we are today. So there's the, there's the uh, presentation, a little history for you. Okay, Thank so you, I Dan. can, I'm ready to ask a question or two. Go ahead, Larry. So to the west of the Sedergren's parking lot, there's a, there's a clear line where Sedergren's parking lot is. And, and, and at that point, the alleyway goes from kind of narrow, right, to a wide area. From that area west to Xerxes. Yep. That has always seemed like the area that would 
that if properly, you know, if paved and lined, we could have angled parking on potentially at least one, either the north or maybe preferably the south side of that. And it would be possible to have a one way traffic movement from Upton through that small little narrow thing that's that you can see to the to the right to the east of the Settergrins parking lot line. And then but if but if traffic went one way from east to west, then that I don't know how long it is, but it seems like it's a hundred yards, perhaps, of city of Minneapolis owned land could be turned into parking for for anyone and everyone. And I, I've always wondered why that isn't an easy thing to accomplish. Well stated, Larry. Okay, so I just tried a technical miracle to share a different screen. Did I, did you get the go, did I, did I pull it off? Yep. Well, yep. We, we have yeah. something, it's very, it, it, I can't, it, you have to move in a little closer, I think, in order for us Whoops. to see what you're looking you know, for, wanting us for to a, see. For a veteran non-technical guy, I'm just glad I got a, uh, the screen to come up. So um, I understand right. the question. During the discussions, during our discussions eight years ago, the um, one of the issues is the you have a, the residents here and the businesses over here, and the residents are the residents. They don't want all that traffic cutting through behind their homes and their private in their basically private alley. And I can understand that perspective. But it's so, not their alley; it's the city's alley, right? Correct. And so, you know, the whole discussion point was, can the residents and the businesses reach agreement? And they never could. Why does the, why do the residences, if it's not the residences property, why does anyone need their agreement? Because then I'm actually turning that alley into a cut through thoroughfare and it's more like, going to act more like a road. And it's not going to act like a private alley. And it, it isn't a private alley, is it? Well, if if um, you know, I'm not up to fully up to speed on all the ordinances, but um, if the alley is used for business access, there's some ordinances that are written addressing that. And so, I'm not sure if we can. Um, if we can do that and open it up and it, and it would become a very high traffic alley. Well, yeah, it would be, it would be a place where many people could park all the people who come in through to the bread store between the bread store and Settergrins, rather than having to turn around and go back out the opposite direction and run into people who are coming in that direction and having to, you know, one of them back up and let the other one get past because there really isn't room for two way traffic on that road. Even now that there's a turnaround, if two cars, if, if cars are parked on both sides and two cars want to pass each other, you can't do it. So it seems to me that it would be wise to have that simply be one way and that yes, anyone who comes in to park would park at an angled park and then continue on their way through to Xerxes. Oh, I, yeah, I understand it. We had that discussion with the residents before. But again, my, and, my question is why are the residents, the residents don't own that property? Right, so the city why, does. Right, so why, 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 why do the residents carry so much power in holding on and holding hostage, it feels like me, the rest of us. Mm, that, yeah, I wouldn't use that term. Fair I enough. Use but, that term. Right. Fair but enough. It, but yeah, then we're sending business traffic down a down an alley. But it's but is it an alley or I mean why why do you call it an alley? 
Because mm, that's how it functions. But that isn't you know, what it is. Really is it, it seems to me that it's Minneapolis city property. It's, it's, it's Minneapolis owned and, mm -hmm. and Minneapolis in, like you said, in, in 2014 or 94, or whenever it was that you gave that, that, that they gave, they vacated part of it to the bread store side and part of it to the uh, businesses on the North. So that now, yeah, it was now in 93, it's, I think it was or four. Yeah. And, but now this, yeah, this, it, it, to me, it, it, play, it, it does look like kind of a blighted alley, but that, yeah, but it, it is city owned. And it, and if it's, if it's city owned, I don't see why city doesn't pave it and use it for parking and help everyone in the neighborhood who's running out of parking. I don't understand why the neighbors who don't own the property seem to have so much power controlling land that isn't theirs that's behind them. They have very deep lots already. Yeah, and then west of Xerxes, um, I was working with a Don Flom and a Jim, Jim Dare many years ago when we built this section on that trolley right away, you're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. So sure. west, so the, um, One of the concepts we had talked about back in the early 2000s was continuing this down through this block and, and ultimately even further. So that was in the mix too. So um, people were going to get together to put together gr a grant application or seek federal money to extend this, what I would call pedestrian way, all the way down and at least to the gate, if not farther, and potentially go further. So there was, that's the third interest in this piece of land. But I, I, I'm gonna go back. I, I, west of Xerxes has already been developed as a walking path with a nice yep. sidewalk. I don't, see any, I don't see any reason to disturb or talk about that area. The area, between Sedergren's parking lot and Xerxes is full of garbage, it's blight, and it's not a walking path. It's just extra backyard for those neighbors. I don't see, it's not, it's not being utilized in a way that benefits the city. And I don't, I don't think that, that the neighbors should have to write a grant. It seems to me that that city with a by simply paving and painting could create could could completely eliminate our parking problem in Linden yeah. Hills because we would get an extra hundred spots of angled parking if we just paved that 120 yards of blighted area that's so I, west of Stettergren's and east of Xerxes. So I just want to interrupt here for a second. So Larry, I, I hear you. I'm just not sure. Don, you, you're not quite clear on exactly how that part, that alleyway, or however it's delineated, um, how that can be, or who controls what happens to that area. Because I know I've asked this question too, and it my, the answer I'm given is that each of those property owners for some reason, and I don't, I, I, and Steve, you might be able to jump in here too. Steve Arnold has shared with me, but my understanding is all of those property owners would have to agree to allow it. And, and I don't think, I don't know that anyone right now knows why that is. I, and I don't think, I don't think, Don, is that right? Well, I'm not going to open up the gate to, to basically put in what would be a one-way road with parking when it's really an alley and you know hey i'm not going to put the money into it and i'm not going to i don't have the money in the capital program to do it but also i i, I would have to check from an ordinance perspective if i even can and there's enough encroachments with this alley it would be pretty messy 
to do. So there, so there are encroachments in the alley? Oh, sure. I mean, even, even this ramp here, that's, I mean, the right of way runs right down here. So, right. I mean, so it, people have it, encroached. Sure. Did, did, did those people get permission to encroach? That, that could have been there for many, many years. So, yeah. so it's, not a, it's not a proposal that I'm, I'm going to pursue. And yeah. also I don't have the money in our capital program to do any work in the alley either. So Don, can I ask a question? You say that yeah. that's not something that you would pursue. Could you address for the group like why that is? Like what are the safety concerns and the, and the you know, as far as maybe not just in the case of this, but expanding it to be like what, how the city views these types of projects or other places in the city where this has come up and the safety reasons why that's not something you would pursue? Is that what the what you're saying? Yeah, that's part of it. This, this alley would then function as a lot of traffic going through it. And, you know, we have problems or not problems, I'll say we have experience with cut through traffic in alleys elsewhere in the city. And it is, um, it creates problems and you'll, you'll see this um, off 50th street where we have to say, don't cut through the alley. Cause you know, people will be waiting to take a left-hand turn say on Lindale at 50th. And so we have signs that say no left turns in the alleys or the side streets. And it, it becomes basically cut through traffic uh, when traffic is heavy. So it, it, it becomes a traffic management problem as well. Um, then, then I think the, the next part is how, how would it be managed? How would that parking be managed? Because to the, to the in this section, you know, from that right away map I showed, it got vacated to the adjacent property owners, and those adjacent property owners are who's managing that right now. Excuse me, the adjacent property owners are managing something. Yeah. So like. And, and what do you mean by stalls, that? Well, these stalls right here, where my right. cursor is, that, that's on the land owned by St. Thomas. And these stalls right here are, are on the land owned by Sedergren. So therefore, Sedergren controls those stalls, whether they lease them or whatever they do. But they are they're in control of those spaces. They don't, it, it looks like this got turned into a sidewalk cafe. Mm -hmm. And yes, not it did. without any permit, without any permitting from the city. <clears throat> yeah, I'm just looking at the photo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it, to, to that case in point, can I just mention? I sorry, I had to step away for a minute, but um it, it seems that. We should, our goal with parking in the neighborhood should be to try and preserve every last spot that we currently have. You know, not to, I don't know, it just seems things keep happening that take spots away, you know? Well, and, and can I, to, to Lisa, to your point, uh, with the limited spots, whether things are being developed for transit corridors and bus stops or hardscape, outdoor cafeterias and things like this. And to Larry's point is the limited parking that we've got or that this, this area has seen um, particularly develop over the last 10 or 15 years is besides the limited number of spaces is, is the access. And the access to the spaces, the access and exiting the spaces is really what's, what's just hampering the entire business district to the point of you know multiple vacancy buildings that have haven't been vacant in 30 plus years and things like this because people can't get in and get their business done and can't support the livelihood of this area and it's it's just changed so dramatically so quickly here that it's that it's it's it you know uh, i think the city has to take a different perspective in my mind as to how they're approaching some of the flow of this traffic whether there's meters on some streets or some access through like larry said you know i yes you don't want to create a highway through the trolley path i get that i understand that 
but I do agree with Larry. I think that the north side of the alleyway or the access could be put in some nice fencing and some things like this and some light, nice paving, some additional spots, and even create a, a barricade that would allow, um, call it uh, residential cars to go through their customer cars that are servicing this area here and not speed allowing the, 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 well more than speed bumps i'm talking i'm talking you know like those brick and beam type structures that you see that basically allow a car or 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 you know you can control what type of vehicle could actually go down in that direction i think that that could be mitigate some of those traffic concerns and the flow and creating a, a, a road you're saying there's areas like this over on about 54th and Lindale, where there is there is um, commercial district that is on uh, Lindale, and there are houses one street over I have good friends that live that back up to this, so they are dealing with um, call it the mixed use of both residential and commercial and things like this going on. And it, there are um, other examples than that. I just happen to have friends that live back up to that right now. And, and they, I see them somewhat regularly and they, they don't complain about that mixed use, you might say. So I think that thinking outside the box, we could come to some mutually beneficial situation that would work for both the residents and the businesses and allowing access and hopefully even creating some more spaces to keep this area alive, you might say. Because right now it's it's on the wane. It's not going the direction I think the residents or any of the community want. If the residents can't understand what some of the business needs are, the businesses won't be there. You know, we, we, we talk about living in Mr. And, and operating our businesses in Mr. Rogers neighborhood. Well, Mr. Rogers neighborhood is is with some of the apartment developments and some of the things that have been going on around here it is, is not going to be around much longer if, if we don't get serious about this. There are lots of, you know, there are uh, empty retail storefronts way more than I would ever be comfortable with it. It, it you know, I have customers come in and they you know, it's a destination. They say, oh, we're here. We want to see everything. But, you know, there's no bee below. There's no good things. There's us and wild rumpus and, and uh, you guys, obviously, Steve and, um, and the, the toy store. And then often, you know, they're, they're disappointed. Do you, do you have anything to say in response to that? Do you, I mean, you had said before that um, earlier, back when you started working on this project, that the residents and the businesses were trying to come to an agreement. Is there, is there even, you know, a reason to try to revisit that? Well, I, you know, times have changed and I, and I think, um, You know, the, the hope was the residents and the businesses could could reach, uh, I don't wanna say compromise, but mm -hmm. a, a shared vision or some shared goals of what they wanted to accomplish. And, and I don't know if we had the right um, mix at the time, but what, you know, what was important to the residents and what was important to the businesses and you know, how would you put together a funding package to do it? Because the, at the time, um, there was talk about, well, maybe we'll do an art fair down this corridor and can we get food trucks? I mean, it went all around with ideas and lighting. And so, I mean, these were the things that were discussed, you know, eight, nine years ago. And, and they couldn't reach an agreement on, on what, what it would be. And then how do you put a funding package together to build it? Okay. Isn't it, I mean, we build roads all the time. This is a very short road. I, I, I don't understand why there's such a funding problem for 120 feet, 120 yards of, of grading and paving and painting. That it, it doesn't strike me as a, profoundly large scale project is a short piece of land and and I are you just talking about this little short piece here I'm talking about from 
from the back of Petter, from the west side of Settergren's parking lot to Xerxes. It's about, I don't okay. know, there's 11 houses and they're 50 foot lots. Or I mean, I don't know if it's 120 yards or 150 yards, but it's, it's just not that long of a road. It doesn't well, strike me Larry, as something- Can, I, can uh, I interject? You know, I was, I headed up the business association, I think, Don, when we've done all these chats with you and we basically were told by um, Lene and by the mayor at the time, which is Betsy, Betsy Hodges, that cars will never be able to exit onto Xerxes, period. And so there was no point in and even that is talking. Because and why? And what's that? Why, why was that? That cars couldn't exit oh, because, onto because, Xerxes? Because the mayor would not, would, would not support it. So it was and just one person saying they didn't want yeah, it was kind of shut down. I'm not really sure what the politics are, and I hate that kind of stuff. So right. I didn't get too involved in it. But I think well, I Don also that at one time Betsy lived on the corner down yeah. there, and she since she doesn't isn't the mayor and doesn't live there any right. longer. Maybe there I hear you. Be the same kind of political. And then Don, I think um, is it true that seventy five or eighty thousand dollars was spent on that turnaround? It's possible. Yeah, I don't. I don't have the. Um dollar number yeah but larry just to your point of how much roads cost i i just wanted to sort of throw that out there that the um you know the little roundabout that's at the back there that money's what money was put toward that from the city i i remember that i was at that meeting <laughs> yeah i um i was at that meeting too where it started at the lynn hill center and then walked all the way down to that junction yeah i i i I, I remember that meeting very well. Was I, I on I that also, walk? I mean, I, you know, I feel yes, like Donnie. I was on a walk or, or did I get, did I end up sitting at Sebastian Joe's having ice cream? I can't remember. <laughs> no, if I, I, was I think you were there, Don, but then I think what okay. eventually happened was there was a, a discussion with the church and with residents and the business owners were not invited and it was, that was what was decided. Okay. I think that's very accurate. And I believe, Don, you were there. And I think that there was a group of, I want to say, 20 of us that I think were, you know, business owners. And I'm, I'm also a neighborhood resident, too. I've lived in the neighborhood yeah. for 25 years. And I think that what the discussion was about the roundabout and access and things like this. And I think, as Lisa said, that there was other discussions that laid to rest some conversations for a while. But this, this, is, a, this is a conversation that is bleeding near and dear to the business community in Linden Hills. It's, it's, I don't know what more I can say. I've, I've managed a harvest bakery for 13 years. And, excuse me. I own the bakery for the last eight years and have managed it for the, uh, the previous 13 years. And I've lived 25 uh, for 25 years, about two block and a half from this bakery. So this community um, I can speak to at great, at, ad nauseum for those that care to listen to me but i just i just i just see the business community just shrinking and shrinking for such a long long time you know the bread store was supported by the nicky nacky store across the street that was sorted by the insurance guy picking up his policy downstairs by the person that wanted to put their offer in a house at a at a realtor's office upstairs that was supported by the kid guy that was supported by the meat people and all of these communities were diverse they could get their craft projects and their things there and could make all of the stops and support each other and it was mutually beneficial in this whole community and now you're just seeing that a lot of the patrons, the bakery's been there for over 39 years and many long-term people just can't deal with the situation the way it is. There's less and less parking. There's people that have come in with deeper pockets than I that have, haven't seen some of their actions um, being detrimental. It's worked for their singular concept, not the 50 businesses that outline this area. And they have made their decisions, like I said, at the detriment of the rest of us. And for such a long time, we were such a supportive community. And now that we have fewer and fewer spots, like Lisa says, and, and the access has become even worse than it ever was because there's additional hardscapes that have been built in very near the center of this uh, business node. It, it's like, like I said, it, it's like it's just being frozen. People are not 
not circulating, that's not moving like it needs to do. And that's the meters on the big streets is another conversation. In my mind, you just can't get access to, to what you need here. So, and, and, and exit, so. Yeah, and I just, just to, um, to echo Steve, I, you know, I have a, I've had a business in, in the same location since 2005. So we've seen a lot of parking conversations, just wanna echo in there. Yeah, Don, uh, just a question. What um, what would you suggest for us? I know that you don't have a dog in the fight, or I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't use that um, no, expression. I, I, but uh, I wish you wouldn't. I, you know, I do care. I mean, I I uh, a Minneapolis kid, although I was over by Lake Nokomis, um, and I, you know, I really care about the city. I started in public works in 1987. Um, and I've been doing this a long time and I, I like to try to find solutions. So I do care. Um, on the one hand, this is really easy. On the other hand, it's very, very complicated. And I, and I think no matter when, whatever you do, you, you got to work with the residents and the businesses in the area. It, you re, uh, I, I was starting to see this before where the, you know, and I've seen this on other projects where the residents and the businesses end up fighting each other and it and it usually doesn't work out too well. You gotta find a you gotta find a solution that you know maybe not maybe it's not perfect but it it works somewhat for everybody. And I think that's your best your best hope to or a best outcome. Everybody's right. and go on, but the but the reality yeah, and going the reality of what's so been go, happening for can many I, years. Sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, Don, can you just, um, we talked a little bit earlier and you said something about that the owners uh, on that, on that uh, right of way, um, they have, they're able to refuse or there's some special ordinance. Could you get that for us just so we understand? How yeah, that I can works? try to track down the ordinance. I, I, I want to say it was council member Schiff who introduced the ordinance and I think it was um, before that's Schiff. About I think it was long it before shift. Because I feel like that would be been. helpful for us just to, to know how to organize or how, how, what, to, how to strategize. So, because we all know parking is a problem and I know that, that we are looking for solutions and, you know, we, we can't yell at you all night or we can't just like, we can just say, like, we can't shake the computer, you know, and just say like, we got to fix this. Like we got to figure out a way to, to move forward. I, you know, so I think that would that be very valuable. Thing, for someone, anyone, whether it's Don or someone else, to find out exactly what is the language that gives the residents so much control over Minneapolis property. I wouldn't phrase it that way. I'd say whenever I do a project, I need to get consent and consensus. And I'm, I don't have it here. Okay. It's no different on any project I do, whether it be Bryant, or Grand, or Gerard, or, you know, I'm picking projects in the South, and I, I could say Johnson Street or 18th. I mean, I do a lot of projects, but really I got I, I try to get consent and consensus on what we do. And it's also not, it's a little more complicated than just putting 16 feet of pavement in there. Um, you know, I, I got to look at lighting and I have to look at stormwater. So it, it's a, it gets really expensive really fast. Well, it's expensive for us, for sure, to not have parking. And I, I, I again, I, I continue to go back to this question of why, I, I've been asking this question for 15 years at least, why is it that, I mean, when you say we need to come together in, in agreement, but for it seems to me that, that the reality is that even if there were only two neighbors who said, we don't want any change, then no change will happen. And I don't see why they have power over land that they don't own. I mean, I'm, I'm in the real estate business and, and all it, it, I'm constantly in the, in, in situations where some person might say, 
I don't want you to build a big house right next to me. And, it, and, and you know, as long as it is built within the, the, co the code, the person who, who, who lives next door to a property can't control that property that's next door to them. And this property is not owned by those residents. So I don't understand why those residents seem to control what happens on property that they don't own. Larry, I think, thank you. And I think, um, but I think we all understand that. And I don't think there's an answer, unfortunately, tonight to that. And I don't think that, you know, like, I think the sentiment is that, and I think that's where you started too, is like, it would be helpful for us to get to the bottom of that piece. Um, and I don't think we have that answer tonight. Um, Correct. But I, I think, you know, point taken and that'll be kind of our next step here. Becky, I'll, should I send whatever information I can find to you? That would be great. Yes. And I can share it with the whole group. Um, we'll be sharing. Yeah, the, I think that's a good, you know, um, that's probably a good starting point is the ordinance or yeah. ordinance with an S. And that's where we're trying to get to, too, is just a better group understanding of because we can't really. And I think, Larry, what you're saying, and I agree with like, we can't move forward. I think Steve was saying this, too, and Lisa it's hard to move forward when we don't fully understand what we're dealing with. So I think that would, that would really help. So thanks. Are there any other so questions? We had, a, we had a history going back to 1908 and I, I showed some, some maps and information. I found it interesting trying to track that down. It, it, um, it's a fascinating corridor. Well, and I wanna thank you, Don, for taking the time. Thank you very much for yeah. being here tonight. Any other questions? I figured out the technology on how to unshare, I think. Unshare. Yep. Good job. You did. Great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Don. Okay. Excellent. Okay, so um, we have uh, a few minutes left to talk about new business. And um, I know Becky wanted to uh, introduce a little something. If, if any of y'all don't have anything. I do. Um, so my daughter's, the tornado sirens are going off. Yeah. I don't know if everybody okay. hears those. Nope, I'm here. So um, Fiona, you're going to be fine. Um, I'm going to have to go. <laughs> but okay. um, so what I was hoping to propose for next time is that Mom. okay i uh peter can you do this for me i'll, I'll take yeah i'll okay, take care I'm so, I know a little so bit about it. okay all right thanks i will have to go as well uh, the sirens are sounding gear and tornado warning was just given <laughs> for southwestern hennepin okay great at least thank you john for joining us lisa you're uh, talking but you're muted I was just saying that it's no longer green, it's black outside. My dogs are freaking out. <laughs> okay, well, I tell you what, like let's we're just ending go. very soon. Yeah. Yeah, let's go. Let's go ahead just in now and I'll have Becky just send out an email to everybody. Um, yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. I'll stay Thank safe. Hunker down. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Bye now. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Tom. I assume that Eric has made it to Charlie's and everybody's set up. Well, try texting. Sometimes you can text when you...